Make that big boss less special It ain't no game, but they say I'm Welcome to the second level Hello, hello. Hello. Thank you for coming. I want to introduce Jason Lee, who's going to be presenting his talk, Intimacy Games, Unlocking the Inner Heart of Fighting Games. Jason, feel free to take it away. Cool. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that I think is really, really important as far as like games are concerned, right? Well, aren't we all? Fighting games are something that I think are a little bit difficult and kind of get a bad rap. Um, which one's the clicker? Cool. For me, and I think for everybody in this room, fighting games are a very particular type of genre of game where there's two people who are trying to beat the crap out of each other and then eventually you will be unable to beat the crap out of each other. One of you is going to run out of resources, be that health, or for whatever reason you just can't fight anymore. Uh, and that's all well and good. There's a lot of flashy combos that go into that. There's a lot of buttons, a lot of interesting mechanics sometimes. Uh, a lot of flashy graphics, a lot of amazing supers, a lot of exciting... Uh, and always two people, always beating each other up. That's essentially what fighting games are at a very surface level. Um, but I think for a lot of introductory people, it's hard to get into that. They can be very, very esoteric. They can be complex to get into. So the mechanics get in the way sometimes, at least as far as dexterity is concerned. So a very, very basic fighting game for me is really The Prisoner's Dilemma and Rock, Paper, Scissors. I think these two things really capture all there is to know about a fighting game in very, very simple examples. If you're not familiar with The Prisoner's Dilemma, it is this idea that you and another person are trapped in a prison. You have two options. One is that you can ally or confess to the, to the government. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, or <laughs> you can betray your friend and, uh, or sorry, or you can, either way you're talking to the government, but you're either betraying your friend or you're allying with them. And you're both basically going to do nothing or you're going to sell out the other person to, your, to the government. And, that has different reward and risk structure to it. And in game theory, it turns out if you only play this game once, you should both lie every single time, even though that's going to hurt both of you in the long term. In the case where you sell out the other person and they don't, uh, that works out really, really well for you. And in the case that you both do it, uh, that you both sell each other out, you're both punished extremely harshly. Uh, in the long run, if you're both in the immediate game, sorry, let me say that one more time. The, if you just play one round of this game, it makes sense only to sell out the other person uh, because it turns out that that has the best potential outcome for you. However, if you play this game multiple times, if you play this game three times in a row, five times in a row, ten times in a row with the same person, that gives you the opportunity, very specially, to understand what that person's potential choice is going to be. Because if you picked Betray the first time and they picked Ally the first time, well now maybe you can both pick Ally. You have that opportunity because you're going to play it more than once. Uh, and that's a little bit closer to what the fighting games are. And because as you play that game over and over and over again, your penalty, or rather your score, is going to accumulate, you have the opportunity to be in this point where you're both lying and both allying with each other over and over and over again, instead of just the first time where you screw each other over and you're both in prison forever. Then on the side of rock, paper, scissors, this is a game where you essentially say, OK, I'm going to pick one of three options against you, and I can that be entirely random uh, to the other person. And you can walk away with no real understanding of what the other person might have done the second time or the third time. It's really when you start playing three out of five rock, paper, scissors that you start getting an idea of what it's going to be. So I can walk up to you and say, hey, I'm going to throw rock three times in a row. Oops. I'm going to throw rock three times in a row, and then when you actually play, I'm going to throw scissors. Uh, playing multiple times gives you the opportunity to do that. Uh, and it's the combination of these two things, one, asymmetrical outcomes, and then three multiple, oops, what did I just do? There we go. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. James. Um, the, the asymmetrical outcomes, as well as having these multiple choices, is really what gets to the heart of what fighting games actually have available to you. Uh, and so some time passes between the invention of rock, paper, scissors, and maybe, I don't know, 1960. I don't know when Star Trek came out. I'm sorry. Uh, now we have rock, paper, scissors, lizards, and Spock. So we have this pentagram of options. Now we have five instead of just three. Fast forward another 20, 30, 40 years, and now suddenly you have something that looks like this. This is Street Fighter in its modern incarnation, Street Fighter V. You have something, you have six standing options, six crouching options, six jumping options. This does not include the 
12 different versions of special moves that this character has, as well as a bunch of different unique attacks that are special to this character. This is a super complicated version of what this might look like, except now you have millions of combinations that you might be able to do. And not only that, Street Fighter now, the modern fighting game, not is just one round and one option. You have all of this, it's a bunch of different options. It's not just one, it's a constellation that it's become. A deliberate choice made by each of the individual players between one another. Uh, and that has to happen multiple times. <laughs> you play one round, another round, and then potentially two more games if you're in a tournament setting. That's a lot of time to try and figure out that you think you might know the habits of another person, and also a lot of chances to know what type of options they might pick. Maybe they like this one for some reason. Or they like this one for some reason. But another person might like these options over here. Those are things that exist in the modern fighting game that I think don't really have uh, parallels in other genres. And oops. so to be successful really requires that you understand round to round, game to game, what that other person is going to be doing. You have to be able to get to the feeling of knowing their habit, knowing their style, knowing their preferences. And fighting games really allow you to do this. And that's something I think is uh, just something special. When I realized that it was in fighting games. I realized there was nothing special about fighting games themselves that have this feeling. You could get this feeling of knowing that other person's style and habits from other types of games. And so that is what led me to this idea this intimacy, um, that feeling that you know the other player. And that can happen between either, either just as a spectator or as a player. Uh, some of the best and most exciting moments in fighting games are when people do that super duper unexpected thing. Uh, there's uh, a couple well-known players like Daigo Imahara, who are just very well known for having that skill in the long game to have in a game where he might have to play 10 games against another person. And that can go on for about an hour. Uh, he is known for dominating the other opponent uh, in a way that no other player really can. Uh, and so he has that ability to know what the other person's habits and what the other person's skills are going to be. Uh, it's all relational because every time he sees that, he predicts what the other person's adaptation to his style might actually end up becoming. And he's able to say, I'm not going to do the paper this time. I'm going to throw the scissor this time in terms of uh, the rock, paper, scissors version. And this one, throw any series of these things because that's what the game demands. Uh, and so once we have this understanding, this idea that intimacy games exist around fighting games, and that fighting games have this intimacy to them, we can start thinking about other games that also have that as well. Uh, it's not something that has to exist for beating each other up. That's not something that I think is necessary nor uh, uh, sort of natural even to that genre because if you look at games like chess, for instance, right, there's a lot of the same ideas going on in play. When people play multiple series of chess, that's how they adapt to one another. When they play Go, very similar. Uh, and this, as it stands, I think the, the intimacy thing, the intimacy games, is really useful as a means of a lens. It lets us build games and design games for this specifically, this feeling that you know the other person. Uh, and we can use that to imitate new hobbies and imitate new uh, new sports. Like, there's no competitive rowing game out there as far as I know. There's no, there's some climbing games that exist. Mount Your Friends is one. Uh, but I think the, it's, it's a productive way to look at games beyond just say, hey, every time I'm going to add an option to this game, I'm going to add a new option for us to beat each other up. Instead, I can think of it as, oh, now I have this new option for, uh, for interacting with another person and for representing myself. Because the huge constellation of options that you have, they're only meaningful in fighting games with relation to the other player because the context of fighting games, and why I think fighting games are so special at this, because the entire system of fighting games is built around this relationship. Because everything you do is in relation to the other person. You cannot move in those games without having it affect the game state of the other person. You can't walk away from the other person without it only you. I'm not just walking away from something else. It has to be walking away from the other player in the context of the game. That's something that you can't get out of for the fighting games, whether it be Street Fighter, Tekken, Soul Calibur, Dive Kick, uh, Nidhogg. They're all in relation to one another. I'm trying to get past you. I'm trying to be in your face. I'm trying to be away from you. I'm trying to run away, or any number of these things. 
Uh, and if you start designing for intimacy, you can start getting games that are like this. Uh, if you're not familiar with this game, Witch Ball, it's a game that uses mode seven graphics in order to imitate running. Very, uh, it's very hard to describe. Uh, there's a game of Pong being played on top of the screen. Uh, maybe I should have gotten a picture if I were more prepared. But there's a game of Pong being played on the screen at the same time as you're playing a mode seven running game, as if you were on this flat plane running on, over a track. Uh, it's surreal and strange, but it's also something that requires you to understand what the other person might do. Because you're still trying to play tennis, essentially, while you're trying to run a race. Uh, another game down here, which I think is over in the other room, if I'm not mistaken, Starcrossed, is a game where you have these two girl characters who are trying to throw a ball back and forth. And while I haven't had an opportunity to play it myself, from what I've seen, it does incorporate a lot of those elements. You need to be in a certain place to interact with another person. Um, there are uh, super rudimentary fighting games now that uh, I think get at some of this core concept of like bringing it back down into the rock, paper, scissors realm from where Street Fighter used to be of that huge, gigantic constellation and then is instead very simplified. Uh, Mount Your Friends, like I mentioned earlier, it gives you tremendous opportunity to climb all over the place on your friends as a means of like, hey, who can get to the highest point first and how am I going to make it difficult for another person? Uh, in a, uh, a turn-based fashion. And then, if you haven't heard of this, this is Consensical, a game that openly describes its intimacy, uh, a game about relationships between uh, a tentacle creature, alien, as well as and a human. And it's necessary in that game to try, without speaking, to play uh, harmonious cards with one another. It's a card game. This is a tabletop example. So the trying to make is that when you design games for intimacy like this, you can really go all over the place. Nothing about it has to be about fighting games. Nothing about it has to be forced into being just uh, being each other and in that space of high aggression, high conflict. Because you can be symbiotic, you can be harmonious in this genre. And you know, when I think about the current competitive landscape for fighting games, you know, it's a very heavily boy-driven market. It's not something that is necessarily welcoming to women or welcoming to people from marginalized communities all the time. And if you can design something like this, you can still create those highly complex mechanical experiences uh, and just give it a new context, give it a new theme to build out new players and new communities. And you'll, you'll be able to just have something healthier there. You will get new perspectives and you'll get something more diverse and more uh, just you increase the likelihood of seeing something that you've never seen before. And I think that's something we should really be striving for when we come to designing these games. Uh, and you know, when I think about fighting games, I saw this image once, and I just thought it was very, very indicative of what where we are in terms of fighting games. It's, I didn't make this image. Uh, it comes from somebody on Reddit who made it as a joke. But you, know, you have these ideas of pure traditional fighting games, and then various ones like Smash Brothers or Dark Souls in some cases. Uh, and then at the bottom here, I think are where all the interesting ones kind of are. These two are single player ones on the left. Uh, Mortal Kombat Mythologies is a side scrolling beat em up game. And this Legend of the Gaia, I believe, is, a, uh, is an RPG where you use fighting game inputs to actually play the game. And then on the right is Magic the Gathering as a fighting game. Games that have no real like visual necessarily represent uh, mimicry or mechanical mimicry of fighting games, still involve that core idea of the feeling of knowing the other player. Uh, and so while these two I don't think qualify, it's Magic the Gathering and all the other ones do when you are playing that with another human being. They all capture that core factor of I feel like I know the other person. And so we can really fill out this two spots, I think, with other games. Uh, this idea of structure radical and mechanical purism and mechanics neutral and structure being radical uh, with something uh, that we've never seen before. So, yeah. That's everything. So I guess if anybody has questions. Uh, this is on Reddit somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I can post it there for sure. Uh, yeah, I find this to be a very funny image. Just the idea of having Guilty Gear Isaka and uh, Smash Brothers side by side is very fun.
Yeah, I think it's something that has really shown itself off in a lot of competitive games, uh, although in different ways. In the fighting game scene, especially EVO, uh, I think it's probably one of the biggest spectator games of all time for uh, having surprising moments. And then there's also the, uh, and that's where all the premier fighting game players go to uh, basically compete to see who is the best, the single best person. Uh, one thing that I think is where you, you kind of go next is where, how do you look at team games out of this? Especially, uh, you know, the biggest competitive games in terms of make, making money right now are uh, League of Legends and Dota. And both of those games, I don't think really capture the same idea of the feeling that you know another player so much as they are about the feeling of knowing your comrades and knowing your team. Uh, and so when it comes to making something that would necessarily build towards that specific uh, feeling of knowing another player, I, you know, I, I will say that I'm not necessarily the best expert on that in terms of saying like, hey, you can do this exactly because it's something that, you know, when we started over here, there's no way to have known that rock, paper, and scissors could have blossomed into this. There's no way really to have known that. And like I said, I think one of the interesting contradictions here is that how is it that this gigantic uh, list, this grid of options, and this isn't even everything, uh, can be utilized by players to become so expressive and to become something that you can really, because once you have all this, suddenly the choices that you do make and the choices you make a lot are deliberate, and they start to mean something about yourself, uh, or at least the choices that you're making. Uh, my background is that as a competitive player, uh, for the most part. So I've been competitive in this scene for the, at least a solid three years, and then I was kind of traveling for a while. And then I've always kind of tried to keep a, an eye on this sort of thing. And I realized the only real generalizable skill I had going from fighting game to fighting game was this idea of, okay, if I know at least the basic set of options, if I know the rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock of the fighting game, I can then figure out what those representations are, whether it be Street Fighter, whether it be Tekken, and then that's the way I would be better at the other fighting game. That's the skill. That was the core of what I was knowing. And everything else was just learning that there was this, as opposed to just being these five. Uh, so that's kind of my background on that. Do you think that other like, traditional fighting game players like, have, like, do they debate at all in terms of like, the like, you're talking about? Or have you like, talked to any of them about this? Like, what's, what's the reaction? So it's a good thing you ask, because very shortly I'll talk to Guilty about some of these things. Uh, will, uh, the next talk will be with uh, Guilty Hayes, a professional Street Fighter player, an eSport player. So she know, yeah, exactly. Uh, won't necessarily be about that, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that uh, not necessarily players actually have talked about. It's commentators that have talked about it. Uh, and when I was part of the scene here, kind of actively involved with, which is, Realization that hey, we need to understand how people are all sort of interacting with each other, and it's like, oh, he did that because he thought that the other player was going to do this, and that's why this is an incredible decision and not a bad one. But why would he have thrown Brock five times in a row? That doesn't make any sense. But he did. Uh, there's a great clip of Alex Valle, a Street Fighter player, recently who just threw, I believe, 19 fireballs in a row. He didn't move; like he just did it to another player. Uh, <laughs> He was at the right distance, at the right, and he just threw 19 of them. Like you can see this extended 30-second period of him just standing there doing it. And the other player just makes it. Like he can't, even though the easy option would be to just jump, he doesn't. He he, he just doesn't. And it's that type of knowledge that is that is necessary, right? So I think one more. Yes, I do think so. Uh, in fact, I was very lucky to have played this yesterday. The Ten, ten Table game, that fighting game, uh, that is a game that mechanically basically it makes it. There's no way in that game really to make solid decisions, at least as far as I can tell. I'm not a pro at that game yet. So uh, making solid decisions game to game or round to round in that game are very hard because your options, it's kind of given this layer between you and actually making those decisions. 
you know, between you and here is this whole gigantic mess, right? Like, sort through first. It's like playing 52 card pickup and then trying to play that thing. Whereas with games like Street Fighter, you're given this immediate ability to, to perform what it is that you want. Uh, so it, it's definitely something that you can design with and around uh, and play with. All right, I think that's time. So thanks again. No game, but they say I'm welcome to the second level.